What's the criteria for calling someone the greatest of all time? For me, it boils down to three things. Technical mastery, winning fights, and a take on all comers attitude. And for my money, the only fighter who fits all of those bills is Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson, who has not only been the champion of multiple MMA organizations, but also took on and defeated not one, not two, but three opponents with an over 100 pound size advantage. But that isn't really all that impressive. To say that someone considered the greatest of all time beat a bunch of guys who aren't that. What is impressive is how he did it and how what he did proved that the best martial art for self-defense is, without a doubt, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Now it's important to understand Mighty Mouse is a professional MMA fighter currently signed with one championship, which means if he's going to fight in MMA, it has to be under one. But he's not signed as a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitor, which means he's free to enter any tournament he wants, from the small tournament at a host gym to Worlds. Which means as long as you're a brown belt in his weight class, you too could slap and bump with the man who did this. But then this monster decided he wants to try himself out at open weight. So his next match was against a 248 pound, six foot three brown belt. If I don't make it, tell my story to my wife, okay? <laughs> and then Mighty Mouse beat him. And then he did it again and again. Here's the thing about Mighty Mouse. Not only is he the 1FC flyweight champion and one of the most gifted athletes and hardest working athletes on the planet, the man is an expert martial artist. Whether we're talking about his elusive, lightning fast striking style, his on my terms wrestling base, or in this case, his world-class Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, the man is a savant when it comes to fighting and quite possibly the living embodiment of Goku. What that means is Mighty Mouse would be a force in whatever sport he chooses to compete in. Whether we're talking about MMA, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai, it doesn't matter. But his chance of success in those arenas is greatly diminished when you give his opponent a size advantage. As I talked about in another video, size and strength do matter, but particularly when we're talking about a sport where hitting is involved. The simple science is larger fighters can generate more force easier than smaller fighters can and longer limbs means they can be farther away when they hit you. So while it's certainly possible for a smaller fighter to win in striking, it's much harder. Grappling is the only competition where there's not a pound for pound best, but a best full stop. Grappling is the only place where a smaller, weaker, slower fighter has an honest chance and method to beat a bigger, stronger fighter. It depends on technique and strategy not strength and size. And Mighty Mouse is him. But what does this have to do with you? What does a professional fighter winning a few fights have anything to do with you and more importantly, your self-defense? Let's be real here for a second. Mighty Mouse has gifts and he has attributes that almost no one else does. But let's take that away for a second. Let's take away his decades of fighting experience and his peak athleticism and leave only his technical skill on the table. What we're left with is a robust arsenal of grappling techniques and strategies that have proven repeatedly to be effective against opponents of his own size and now of a greater size. And if we're talking about self-defense, we're not worrying about only fighting someone on our own terms at our own height and weight, but anybody from any weight class. Look, I've devoted a good portion of my life to learning how to kick dudes butt good, and I'm pretty successful at it. But even I have to recognize that once size and strength become a big enough discrepancy, there's not a lot my kids can do to stop a bigger opponent. Which means, as much as it pains me to say it, grappling is the best option for self-defense. Are things like liver shots and joint strikes viable options? Sure, but there's a lot of variables to consider here. Am I likely to A, hit the target in the first place, B, hit it hard enough to actually be able to drop somebody, and C, hit it without getting myself hit multiple times on the way in? Maybe, maybe not. The thing is, there are no guarantees in a fight. I could have the best right straight of all time, but 
I don't really have a guarantee that it'll be enough to put my opponent away. Striking is pain compliance most of the time and incapacitation some of the time. But with grappling, a choke is a choke. If you can wrap your arms, or in this case a gi, around someone's throat and keep it there long enough, eventually they will pass out. And if you can twist someone's joint in a direction it doesn't want to go, eventually it will break. And it really doesn't require that much strength to do that. Bottom line, if you're concerned with self-defense, you need to be concerned with grappling. Learning how to take control of, manipulate, and disassemble the human body is a way more high percentage technique than striking ever could be. However, what I'm not implying is that jujitsu is all you need for self-defense. Because equally, every opportunity Mighty Mouse had to win in competition created a situation where he could get very hurt in self-defense. And now guys, I'd like to take a brief minute to shout out today's sponsor, X Martial. X Martial is the name in quality martial arts apparel. They provided today's t-shirt and have a whole catalog of awesome t-shirts, rash guards, shorts, and even more. If you want to check it out for yourself, there's a link down in my description. Be sure to use code COMBATSD for 10% off your order. So help support the channel and get yourself some awesome apparel at the same time. Now back to the video. First, the elephant in the room. Grappling is much easier when your opponent has to grapple back. In other words, if someone's allowed to strike, it's much harder to grapple with them. This moment right here is impressive, but gets dangerous when you think about what would have happened if his opponent was allowed to lift and spike him to the ground. But again, I'm not saying grappling is the only way to win a fight, only that increases your likelihood of winning. However, we should address that if Mighty Mouse's opponents had been allowed to hit him, he probably would have been allowed to hit them back. And even with a size and strength advantage, I feel like the 1FC MMA champ probably would have been prepared for that. Same token, even though Mighty Mouse did win three out of his four competitions, he only won one by submission. The rest were done by decision, which of course doesn't exist in the real world. Now, that's true no matter what sport we're talking about, but in a situation where you're tying up with somebody, time really is of the essence. However, a win is still a win, and even decision wins still are good for my theory. Ultimately, what I'm saying is not that grappling is all you need for self-defense, which should be a no-brainer. You need a little bit of grappling, a little bit of striking, and a little bit of clinch. Actually, I want to refine that because it's a bit of an oversimplification. The reality is if you want to succeed in MMA today, you need a lot of one of those areas and a decent amount of the others. Or you can be like Mighty Mouse and have all three, but that's not the point. But if your concern is self-defense, you really need to have a lot of either grappling or clinch and a respectable amount of striking. Striking is important, but really what's important is knowing how to defend yourself from strikes, not necessarily how to throw strikes. The real ratio for self-defense training is something like 40% grappling, 30% clinch, 25% striking, and let's say 5% weapons. Now you can mix up grappling and clinch as much as you prefer, but that's basically the ratios you need to have. But I digress. Ultimately, what Mighty Mouse did is ridiculous and becoming of someone considered the greatest of all time. But is that really that much of a surprise? That someone who's already a world champ with a Sherlock Holmes level of fight IQ and peak athleticism would win a few fights? No, what's more impressive is what this guy did. Lost to the heavyweight champion. Um, he won his division. That's the first time I ever submitted in a competition. So uh, it's bound to happen. The only person who doesn't lose is the person who stops, stops competing. Everything that Mighty Mouse was doing to offset the strength and size advantage his previous opponents had, this guy now had to contend with. Meaning, he was dealing with an opponent who could take out opponents bigger than him. And he was able to beat someone considered the greatest of all time. With a choke, might I add. Does this take away from DJ's legacy at all? No, of course not. And does this mean that Brandon Paul Gagnon is the real greatest of all time? No, it doesn't mean that either. But it does prove my point that Jiu Jitsu is the greatest equalizer in all of martial arts. It's the only realm where smaller fighters can accurately depend on beating larger fighters and where regular people like you and me actually stand a chance against world champions. Now, I wanna make clear, 
I'm not taking away from Brandon Paul Gagnon's victory. He worked very hard and he himself is already a world-class competitor, but that's not the point I'm making. So is Demetrius Johnson the greatest fighter of all time? Yes, 100%. He's competing and winning at the highest level of MMA, routinely taking out champions from multiple sports and challenging himself in brand new ways. But that was never the point. Arguing that is like saying that water is good for hydration. Ultimately, my point is that Mighty Mouse is a divining rod for all martial artists interested in self-defense, who shows us that a focus on grappling and clinching creates a high likelihood of success against opponents our size and bigger. Let's see how bad Bradley Martin wants to fight him now. 